Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles, and it could very well easily be named the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles in that 15th chapter, Acts chapter 15. Uh, you heard uh, Matthew a few minutes ago talk about that our world is facing some extreme problems. Here's the thing that we all need to be reminded of. That is that God knew all about these problems long before they ever got here. And every problem that you and I will ever encounter or face in this life has been addressed in uh, the Word of God. Now, it's easy for us to listen to the news accounts. It's easy for us to look at the newspapers and the televisions and think that uh, they may have some of the answers to these problems and these perplexities. But the fact of the matter is, friends, the real answers to life's perplexities come from God's holy word. Today I want to talk to you about the sin of racism. The sin of racism. What does the Bible say about racism? Uh, you all know the commands in Matthew chapter 28. When the Lord says, I want you to go into all of the world. And I want you to teach. And I want you to preach. And I want you to baptize. And I want you to make disciples from every nation. From every ethnic group from all over the world to all peoples. Now, a good definition of the term prejudice is this. It's an adverse judgment or opinion formed and without the knowledge or examination of the facts. A preconceived preference or idea or bias. Now, when you get to thinking about forming an opinion and an idea about someone without having all of the facts, do you think that that could be, the pure definition of the word itself, could it be a barrier that would keep us from accomplishing what Christ has commanded us to accomplish in Matthew 28, in winning people to Jesus and making disciples? And the answer to that question is absolutely. When we form opinions about people without having all of the knowledge, what's it going to do? It's going to cause us not to go to that person and to talk to that person about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that you and I as children of God are expected by the Lord and commanded in the word is that you and I are to be prophets in our society. And that means that when we see an injustice, we are to confront that. And we're to speak out against it. We're to be priest to sinners. I love preaching on uh, the personality of Barnabas. How he was such a great encourager. He was a bridge builder. And, and, and thank God for that. And, and you and I, according to scripture, are to be bridge builders. We can't build the bridge. The bridge has already been built at Calvary and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ but our responsibility is to be bridge builders and seeing that they get to that bridge so that they can come to faith in Jesus. We're to be partners with the saints of God. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. The Bible tells us that we are to bear one another's burdens. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? That's scriptural, isn't it? And so when we see somebody that is under a strain, when we see someone that is suffering injustices, when we see someone that is carrying a heavy burden, the Bible says that you and I are to get under that burden with them and help bear that load. But keep in mind, while we are to be prophets, while we are to be priests, while we are to be partners with the saints, we also have to see ourselves as people that are in need of God. You know, you know, it's very easy, and I watch this happen quite often. 
I, I watch people find it very easy to go point out the faults and the failures and the uh, injustices that occur in other people at the expense of seeing their own need for the move of God in their life. And so while we are quick to point out the defaults in other people, let's make sure that we understand that we're in need of a touch of God ourselves. Uh, you know, the New Testament is absolutely power-packed full of uh, instances of prejudice, um, mainly in a religious context. Uh, we see that the Jew and the Gentile for generations hated one another. I, I mean, they wouldn't, even, uh, they wouldn't even go into another's house. When they were in public view, they, they wouldn't... Uh, they wouldn't touch one another. And that hatred filtered down through family after family, through generation after generation to the point that when a Jew would pray, uh, he would say, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like that dog Gentile. Religious prejudices was a big, big problem. I want you to see with me in chapter 15, in verse number one, this attitude of prejudice. As a matter of fact, it is the attitude of all prejudice. Watch this. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, uh, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, uh, you cannot be saved. You say, well, Mike, now explain to me how that, that is the attitude of all prejudice. The attitude of prejudice is this. Why can't you be like me? In other words, here they were centering the discussion around circumcision. Why can't you be like me? And until you get like me, then you're not ever going to be able to get into the kingdom of God. Now, there was a problem then arose in the church because a lot of Gentiles started getting saved. And while they were getting saved, they wanted to be a part of the church. And so the problem came up immediately, a prejudice and the Holy Spirit of God very quickly began to deal with them about that problem and help them to make some very quick decisions that helped them to overcome the barrier of prejudice in that early church context. And this morning, I want to take just a few minutes and I want to dissect those principles. I want to show you clearly out of the Word of God how that they overcame it and I do believe with all of my heart those principles transcend all the way into our culture and into our time, into our generation, and personally into our own lives. Hope you got a pen and paper. By the way, thank you for those of you that have joined us through uh, live streaming. And I hope that you'll hang in here with me. I got six of them that I want to share with you in these brief few minutes that we're together. First of all, I want to use the word education. Education. You know, uh, watch this, if you will, in verse number two, and I want you to see what I mean by it. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dis disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them, now watch, should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. In other words, hey, uh, let's find out all that we can find out about this situation uh, so that we can overcome this barrier. Let's get educated about what the issues are. You, know, you understand something? If I build a prejudice against someone, it's because I don't know them. And if I don't know them, then I'm not educated about that person. I'm not informed uh, about that person. Now, uh, hear me just a minute because... This is a subject matter that I knew nothing about as I was growing up. If you had used the term racism, I wouldn't know what you were talking about. If you'd used the term prejudice, uh, I wouldn't know what you were talking about because it really was not in the context of my childhood. It was not in the context of my upbringing. It was not something that I had to deal with at all as I was in my formative years of life. But on the other hand, there are a lot of you that are sitting here under the sound of my voice uh, that you were absolutely inundated with it while you were growing up. 
It was a major issue uh, in your life. And uh, it may have been around race or it may have been around religion. But one of the things that I, I encourage you in breaking down the barriers of prejudice, you got to educate yourself about them. I, I don't know, I, let me just ask this question. How many of you already have seen the video forum that we posted uh, on the website at the end of this week? How many of you saw that? Let me just see your hands, many of you, many of you. If you haven't, I encourage you to do that. I pulled together Dr. Alvin Summers and Dr. Janice uh, Monday and the sheriff of Union County. And we uh, took about an hour right here on this stage and we talked about this very issue of racism and how it's a, a, a reality in the life of a lot of people and what you and I as children of God need to know about that issue. It was simply that. Here is some knowledge that you need to understand and have a part instead of forming your opinion before you get all of the facts. Now, um, I read something just recently that came out of a major magazine that talks about some of the real issues that people still face even today in our culture. One of them would be um, taxis that never stop to pick up a certain person. Uh, another one was uh, suspicious shoppers that may come into the boutique or into the mall or fear of a black man maybe <clears throat> unequal service or the unwelcomed mat that would be rolled out. No respect in many situations and complete surprise that you could be successful. Uh, so these issues are still real. Uh, they still exist. They still permeate. And so we've got to ask the question. First of all, we've got to ask, have I ever done that? And the second question is, have I been a victim of that? The second question you've got to ask yourself is, uh, will I respond whether I have done it or whether I have been a victim of it? Am I going to respond in a biblical fashion? Am I going to respond if I have done something like that? Am I going to respond with the spirit of repentance and ask God's forgiveness and if I have been a victim of that, am I going to seek a biblical way of extending forgiveness to those uh, that victimized me? So you, you need to confront that. Now, you and I know even as early as this morning uh, when our nation has suffered another question mark and issue that we're having to deal with out of Atlanta, there, there are all kinds of political issues that surround this subject matter. And you need to understand, I'm not going to deal with all of those political issues, but I am going to just deal with the foundational issue of how you and I can overcome personal prejudices in our life. And, and I'll just tell you, uh, and I'll say this again before the message is over with, our problems are not going to be solved in Washington, D.C. Our problems are not going to be solved in a political forum. They don't have the solutions to these problems. But if we can get down to the very foundation and deal with it on a personal level, somebody said that racism is an equal opportunity employer. All of us have to search our hearts. Every one of us have to dig down deep and ask the Holy Spirit of God to reveal our hearts to us. And if repentance needs to take place, then uh, by all means, get to Jesus and repent. And if forgiveness has been asked for, then in the name of Jesus, grant that forgiveness. Now, let me give you the second word that I want to deal with is not only just education, but collaboration. Collaboration then let me just say, uh, if you have a personal prejudice in your life, you have a biblical responsibility to go to those individuals and to make it right with them. That, that's clear in the word of God. So let's look back at Jerusalem for a minute and let's just see how they dealt with it. Look at verse four. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church 
and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. What, what, what's so simple about this is this. They met together. They collaborated together. These Jews and these Gentiles who hated one another desperately saw the tremendous need. We, well, you know what? Uh, th this is not just going to go away. Let's sit down together and let's discuss and let's talk about this issue. Deep in their families for generation, they had to do something about it. Now, I want you to understand something. Unless we can get together, unless we can talk, unless we can collaborate, unless we can dialogue together about this issue, those problems are going to continue. It's just going to be a, a develop a scab that's not going to go away. And another instance somewhere along the way is just going to open up that wound until we get down to the very basics and to deal uh, with it. Eventually, we're going to have to get together. Now, the third is this. It is the word, not only education and collaboration, but the word administration, administration. Somebody had to come to the forefront. Somebody had to step up to the plate. Somebody had to be the leader. Watch this in verse seven. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Look at verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, without a leader, here's what happens to humankind. Without somebody leading, we will default to selfishness. Now, I have an Apple computer, and when I turn my Apple computer on every day, uh, my default screen, home screen, is a picture of me and my little granddaughter. I just smile every time. It's several years old, as a matter of fact. But I just like that picture. And, and, and and now I can change that default setting and I can change that picture, but right now, uh, that is the default setting on it. Now, if you take away all leadership, what mankind is going to do is that he is going to revert to a life of selfishness. Now, I said I wasn't going to get political, but um, I, I will address one thing that I think is the most ridiculous thing that I have ever heard of in my life, and that is to completely do away with the authorities of the police. Now, uh, do, do, um, you understand, God set up authority in our lives. And, and, and are there... Uh, some policemen that are rogue, absolutely. But by and large, you know, thank God for these men and women who risk their lives every day to keep us safe and to keep us guarded. Do, do some of them mess up and do stupid? Absolutely, they do. And I listen, there is absolutely no room for that. None. Get rid of the bad cops. Get rid of them. But now, I've already gone way further than I intended to go. But you understand, when you take away leadership, people then revert to selfishness. That's why the Lord set up authority over us. Two of our most revered leaders in this country, Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King, they had a dream and they stepped out and stepped up and led us out. Um, Simon Peter, by the hand of God, was chosen uh, as the leader, but he had to deal with this stuff in his own heart long before he could ever get to the point that he could be a leader himself. If you go back into Acts chapter 10, you find Simon Peter. He goes up on the roof of a house. He gets up on that roof and falls into a trance. Spirit of God began to deal with him. And in this 
trance. He saw a sheet come down and all kinds of animals on it. God said, kill and eat. He said, no, I can't do that. It's against the rules. I, I, I was brought up not to do that. A second time, the sheet comes down, kill and eat. No, 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 I can't do that. Third time, sheet comes down, all down, kill and eat. No, 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 can't do that. God was preparing him because about that time, somebody knocked on the door and it was uh, somebody wanting um, help for Cornelius who had a huge desire to come to know the eternal faith in Jehovah God. And Simon Peter had to go and to deal with that. You think for a minute that God was getting Simon Peter ready in chapter 10 to do with him what he was going to do with him in chapter number 15. And the answer is absolutely, positively, yes, that's what happened. Look at verse 34. Notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there, still Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of God with many others also. Let me ask you a question based on verse 34 and 35. In your mind and in your thinking, do you think that there is a group of people that God can't reach? If you do, then you're prejudiced. Because the word of God has commanded us that we're to go into all nations, to all kingdoms, to every ethnic group, and preach and teach the gospel. We need leadership in this country, without a doubt. Uh, we need leadership in our schools. We need leaderships in the business offices of this land. We need leadership within the context of families in our land. Leading in the aspect that says that God made us different and because of that there is value in it. And if I can't see that there is value in the differences that God has made, then I am just simply missing out on the greatness of God somehow. We need leadership in our churches. Uh, I'll speak uh, to any pastor who may be listening right now. Uh, don't avoid the tough subjects. Lead your church. If we could see and if the world could see somehow, let, let me just rephrase that. If the world sees the same attitudes in the church that it sees out there in the world, what in the world makes us think that they want to get what we have? Let me give you the next one. Ready? Not only administration, but activation. Look, look with me, if you will, at verse uh, 19. Now, James has grabbed the microphone and he stepped up to the plate and to the podium and he's making this statement. He says, wherefore, my sentence is, is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. In other words, James is saying, you know what? <laughs> we don't need to be a barrier to these that are coming to faith in Christ. It's time for us to put our mouth to work. It's time to put action to our words and let's quit talking about this stuff and let's do something about it. That's what James is saying. So my word today is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's get busy in our families and say, you know what? We're not gonna say that stuff in our house anymore. Let, let's get busy on our jobs and let's just say, you know, I'm not going to listen to that kind of talk anymore, much less engage in it. Let's get in our schools and you students that are listening, let's get in our schools and let's make a difference for the cause of Christ. And when you hear prejudicial statements, stand up and speak out. 
one of the great regrets that I have in my life. I'm not saying guilt. I used that term the other day and somebody misunderstood me and took on as a spiritual issue and problem in my life. But I don't have guilt about it because all that's been under the blood of Jesus since I got saved. But I do have regret when we had segregation occur in our church. I watched some of my white friends attack some of my black friends and I just ignored it. Would to God that I had stepped up. Speak out. Now there are two ways to break through prejudice. There's man's way of doing it and then there's God's way of doing it. If you want to see what man's way is capable of, go back to the Old Testament and get into the Tower of Babel when the Tower of Babel was being installed constructed that was just going to go higher and higher and higher and and all of the people just got together and they said you know what man we can accomplish a whole lot if we'll just get together and so they got together with a common goal with a common purpose of building the tower of Babel and boy did they ever build it and the higher they got with it the more godlike they saw themselves and the more pride that they took into the work of their hands. The problem was the higher they built that tower, the further away from God they became. And the result was a human solution to the point, look what we did. Look what we created. That's why we need pastors that will dare to take the word of God and address the issues preach the whole counsel of God and to say to the world that is out there, there is a far different issue than what the world is talking about and there is a far different solution to the issue than the world is offering. It's time for pastors to say and to take the lead and to come to the conclusion with their congregations our world doesn't have the answers. Politicians don't have the solutions. And ladies and gentlemen, until we get to the point that we can run to the cross at the very foot of the cross where Jesus bled and died, until we can get people to come to faith in Jesus, these barriers are not ever going to come down. But when we can get to the cross, every barrier is going to come down. The cross is the solution. Listen to Ephesians 2. It was also Christ's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups, to make them one into the body of Christ and to bring them back to God. Christ did all this with his death on the cross. Understand that the result of human effort is pride, but when we can get people to Jesus, the result is peace. Christ. Christ is our peace. Let's get to Jesus. Let's get to him. You know, here's the deal. When I run to the cross, I realize how much I need to be forgiven. When I run to the cross, I see how much forgiveness needs to be offered to others. We're all the same. Get to the cross. When I get to the cross, I, I discover that Jesus loves me. And when we get to the cross, I discover that Jesus loves you. He loves us equally. And his sacrifice was for every one of us. Jesus is our peace. I'll give you the fifth word. So make sure you're in the spirit of observation. Watch this in verse 20. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now here's the message in the letter. It's great that you're coming to Christ. But understand 
that there is still a command and an expectation in your walk with God from God that you walk in moral purity. There are moral expectations. Now here what, here's what's happening. Our world, uh, Jay's got this stuff all mixed up. I, our world is all jumbled up and we got it all out of whack. You understand uh, that uh, we're, we're not talking now about racial prejudice. We're not talking now about national prejudice. Now what we're talking about is moral prejudice. Here's what some say. Some people will look at us and they will say, well, if you disagree with me concerning a moral or a morality, then you are prejudiced against me. You ever had anybody say that to you? You ever heard that been mentioned? Of course you have. Subtly, but you have. Some of you maybe not so subtle. The book of Acts, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says it's okay to be together. But God's word still has some moral requirements. So here's one of the things that I've come to say today. It is not racist to say that everybody needs Jesus. It is not racist to say, according to the word of God, what you are doing is wrong. That's not being a racist. No matter what culture you were brought up in, if the teachings of that culture run against and come against the teachings of the Word of God, then your cultural teachings are wrong. It is not wrong and it's not prejudice to say what culture has taught is wrong. Our culture taught me wrong. It taught me that success was materialism. That's not the word of God. But let me just say this. Now hear, hear my heart. I think, you, I think you hear what I'm saying. But let me come back now and say what is prejudiced is for you to refuse to spend time with those who don't know Jesus because you don't agree with them. Final word. Number six. Inspiration. Inspiration. The church got together in Jerusalem. And uh, you, you, you can go home and, and read chapter 15. Uh, but they got home, uh, they, they got, got together and they wrote this letter and they put Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Judas, four of these men, and they sent them up to Antioch to encourage these new believers who had been saved by the droves uh, in that town following the martyrdom of Stephen. And the diaspora took place. And, and, and a lot of Christians wound up up there in Antioch carrying their faith with them and people of color and different dialects and different languages started coming to faith in Christ and were gloriously saved. And this delegation was sent up there to Antioch to encourage them in the faith and to teach them the word of God. And the Bible says they had to stay there for a whole year doing nothing but discipling these new believers. Encourage it. Boy, if there's uh, ever been a time in my life that this nation needs encouragement from each other, it's now. And if we're going to see racial prejudice and the barrier of racial prejudice come down, we're going to have to get involved. And we're going to have to become encouragers. I did a little research uh, and the uh, Pew Research Group said that 
over 50% of the American people uh, saw no need to be that encourager. Saw no need, saw no problem with racism in the country. Over 50% of the Americans. How can you turn on a news account and not see that there's a problem? You had a lot of people, yeah, pastor, there's a problem. Yeah, we've got a problem, but never do anything about it. I want to ask you today, why not right now decide as God gives me the opportunity, as God raises up opportunities for me, I'm going to decide to speak up and speak out and I'm going to encourage and I'm going to love. And I'm going to try to understand. You know, the problem most of us is we want to be understood rather than we want to understand. We've already formed in our minds an opinion without gathering the facts. So many are suffering the hurts of prejudice. I don't pretend to know all of them. And I'm not going to try to make a list of them. And I want you to hear what I believe personally is the greatest hurt that is caused by prejudice. And that is that we hold off at arm's length others that keeps them from coming to faith in Jesus and being saved. To me, that's the greatest hurt of all. And my final statement from this message is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever he gave the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I pray to God that we would never, ever be a barrier that kept people from being saved. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the privilege today of being able just to talk about your word and Lord, how your word is applicable to the problems of our day. And Lord, when we look at the massive issues that our country is facing right now, it looks like this humongous elephant to us. But God, we can take that first bite. We can start with the very basics and God, we can just investigate our own heart and our own minds, our own lives. And God, if there's anything there that we need to repent of, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would grant that gift unto us. And then God, uh, for those that have, uh, Lord, sought for forgiveness, may forgiveness be given, may, may forgiveness be received. Have your will and your way in our midst today. You said in your word, if my people, which are called by my name, and that's First Baptist Church and Indian Trail, would humble themselves, pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways, God, you said we'd hear from heaven. You would forgive our sins. And you would heal our land. Our land needs healing. God, let it begin right here in this room. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.